All right. You're listening to 91.5 WUML Lowell Blues Deluxe, and it's my honor and pleasure to have Tom Clausen from Buck 69 on with me today. Hello, Tom. Hi, John. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I want to, I'm just going to let the listening audience know how I found out about you. A friend of mine that I work with was on, I think, Spotify, and he stumbled on one of your songs and he he texted me and said you got to hear this band they're great lo and behold i started digging into your band and i loved everything i was hearing and i said to him thank you for that tip i'm gonna see if i can get someone from the band on with me and guess what i was able to connect with you and we're doing it now sounds good sounds good so ask me ask me anything you want. Okay. Well, <laughs> at six, at sixty five, I'm not bashful. All right. Um, starting out as a kid, did you know you were going to be playing blues or rock music back then, or what? What were you listening to growing up? Um. Actually, I didn't really start. My mom, she listened to uh, Detroit, like Motown, Motown and uh, Rita and uh, Sam Cooke and Johnny Mathis, that kind of stuff. And uh, my dad was totally on the opposite. He listened to like Hank Williams Sr. and Bluegrass, uh, that type of stuff. And my mom would say, told me when I got older as a kid, when I was real little still in diapers, I'd stand in front of the TV whenever bandstand come on or soul train and I'd be dancing. And she said, I, she knew I always liked music and, and loved it a lot, but music really didn't come into my life or anything. I didn't have, I got four uh, sisters and three brothers and none of us, nobody was music in the, in the family or anything like that. Um, and it was probably, about eighth grade, I was going by a ice cream social type thing. People probably don't know what that is nowadays, but uh, and there was a, a rock band playing, and it, it was you know Johnny B. Good and House of the Rising Sun kind of stuff and everything. And I was checking it out, and I was like, you know, I really like that. And then eventually, uh, I got uh, like ninth grade. I was big in sports. I was playing football, running track, and wrestling, and all that stuff. And um, I watched the movie about Hank Williams Sr., uh, the life of the life of Hank Williams Sr., and it was like, that's what I want to do. I want I want to do that. I want to write songs, and and play music. And so, tenth grade come around, and uh, I turned in my football stuff, and I went home, and I told. Uh, I, I told my dad, I said, I, I quit football and I'd been playing several years and he was so upset. And he says, get out, get out, just get out of the house. And he kicked me out <laughs> like 10th grade. And uh, I started walking down the street and, and my, I guess my mom says to him, well, if he's leaving, I'm leaving too. So out she come and she starts walking down the street with me and, uh, we get a little ways down and my dad comes out and yelling, get your ass back home. And so we went back home and my dad didn't talk to me for about a month. And, um, next thing I know, uh, it was my birthday come around in November and he bought me a Gibson or I'm sorry, a Fender F-150 acoustic guitar. And so I started playing it. And within like six months, I was playing in the bars rhythm guitar and had a lead guitar player and a drummer. We didn't even have a bass player. Um, and then he seen that I was serious and uh, he got me a Fender quad reverb amp and a Gibson L6 uh, electric and uh, a microphone. And the next thing you know, Friday nights come around and he says, load up the car. We're going to the bar. And he, we'd load up the car and me and him, we'd go down to one of the bars and says, my kid's playing for free. And we'd sit there and I'd play music in the corner, singing Hank and Cash and Johnny Be Good and stuff like that. And uh, they'd load my amp up with shots of black velvet on it. And I'm, I'm like 16 and a half, 17. <laughs> and we'd sit there and play. And then the, the bar would close at one o'clock and dad say, OK, we're going to my house. 
and here's my mom and brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest, but they're all in bed sleeping. We'd haul in six, seven, maybe 10 people, play music till seven o'clock in, in the morning. Everybody go home and we'd wait till the next weekend. And or if the band had a gig or something, we'd go and play and stuff. But I, I did that till I was uh, ready to leave high school. When I got so, married. I so were you up. shocked when he when he handed you a guitar the, after yeah. everything? everything yes. that he said to you yes yes it, it was it was very strange but i mean i mean i spent so much time uh, my bedroom was in the attic and uh, i listened to i mean i could sing all the hank williams songs and stuff and i'd sing along with them constantly and so i, I think he kind of realized this is what i wanted to do i i mean i'm like 155 pounds soaking wet. What am I going to do playing football against some big guy? It, it, yeah. I just never put any weight on and stuff. Like I knew that that was not my place to go. That was not where I needed to go. So, and he figured that out too, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's good. So acoustic, you were doing acoustic, you were doing electric too at the same time. Yeah. We, I, and, but I've always, been a lead singer and played rhythm guitar i never um my biggest thing I, I didn't want to i didn't want to really play covers um i always wanted to write my own songs and, and just be me be my own person type of thing and uh it's always been that way it still is today i don't have a problem with paying playing covers or anything like that. And I've done it lots of times, actually, even right before COVID hit for a few years, me and uh, a good friend of mine, TJ Karras, we were doing acoustic gigs around town and things like that. We actually went down and played at Ohio State Fair. Um, that was like the second time I've been down there. Uh, I was down there with the band years before that. And um, my son and I did a bunch of acoustic stuff. We played at the blues challenge down in memphis my son and i for that and uh that was 2012 which, i read uh yes yeah it was uh, great times great great people i mean all the people you get to meet and stuff but it's, but i as i got later in in the high school my senior year and stuff like that i started getting more you know i was listening to skinner and allman brothers um that's the stones crochet taylor all the songwriters Yep. uh dylan harry chapin i i really always leaned a lot towards the songwriters singer songwriters most right of those guys right yeah right. so you were doing acoustic stuff you were writing songs and then what was it 2004 your son you you and your, your son said let's go put a band together yeah he's uh I had a son pass away in 1999. Uh, my son Alex's young younger brother, and uh, uh, it, he took that really, really hard. Uh, they were really close and stuff like that. And of course, I mean, as well as we did. And so, for like two years afterwards, um, he was kind of like missing in action, and uh, there, there was just a lot of distance between everybody, sadness, that type of stuff, and everything. But uh it was probably like 2002 and uh right in there and everything i went down to where he was living and here he had been learning to play lead guitar and stuff like that um you know the thing like the crossroads where somebody you just go somewhere and take off and nobody hears from you for a couple yeah. of years yeah. <laughs> and uh so he, he put his feelings and stuff like that into playing guitar and stuff and he became really really good lead guitar player uh rhythm lead and uh we, we were hanging out a little more and he says, uh, maybe we should do some open mics. And I, cause I hadn't been playing either for a while. And uh, so, you know, I, I started a career. I, I raised the kids, got them through high school and everything. And, and he was like, yeah, you got to start playing again. You got to start. And I picked up the guitar and he got a guitar and we started doing open mics around town here in Toledo for like two years. And, um, we met Candace and a, a bunch of other musicians from around Toledo and everything. And, and, and like you say, it was like 2004. He's like, it, it, he said, we got to start a band. <laughs> and I'm like, 
<laughs> okay, so we went from acoustic to doing a band. The next, and so we tried that for like six months. And the first people we hooked up with and started playing, and um, my son didn't click with them. And he said, no, we got to we gotta search out and get better musicians and stuff like that. He says, uh, so I said, all right. And I went around town and I met Buzz Anderson. He was the same age as my son. And uh, he was up and coming and, and really on the blues, blues rock scene, really good guitar player. And he had a keyboard player. He had a drummer. He had a bass player. And so I talked to him and stuff. And I said, hey, you know, I, I'm looking at starting this band, Buck 69, and um, but we're not going to do bar gigs. We're only going to do like fairs, festivals, and I want to concentrate on producing maybe one or two CDs, original songs, that kind of stuff and everything. And uh, they said, sure, we're on board. And uh, so we started the band and we started playing and I started putting the songs together and um, I would write out the music and the lyrics and stuff and I'd do a recording of me with the acoustic and I'd give it to everybody and I'd give them an idea of what I was looking for as far as the sound and everything. And my whole idea was the band would be, uh, my son was more of a rock guitar player um, and Buzz was more of a blues guitar player. So I figured I'd have both of those two guys, guitars, bass, Candace singing backup and uh, Dave Allen came, you know, we, great drummer, uh, really good. Plus he had good vocals and, and we all clicked. So the keyboard player, the drummer and myself, we were the old, old parts in the band. I mean, we were the older guys that have been playing a while. And, and then of course, and then Buzz and Candace and my son and Todd, and they were all younger. So it was a good mix. We had young and old mixed into it, to it together, yeah. which we clicked. It, it really worked well. Let's talk about Candace. I was like, blown away when i saw that she was uh, an american idol one of the people that uh the second american idol i guess she was uh she competed she made in. it into the, she made it up to top 32 and went um she was real young as well and uh i met her at a, a place in toledo called the roadhouse where they had open mics on wednesday nights and uh alex and i would go there a lot of times and play and we met her there and, and she would sing and stuff like that. And um, my son, Alex, knew her for had known her for a couple of years already before that. And uh, she uh, got the chance to audition and her and a, a friend of hers, they went out to California, auditioned and she made it to the first round or so and made it in the top 32. And uh, wow. When she came back. Um, my son, Alex, when we were putting the band together, he says, let's talk to Candace. Maybe she'll want to do backup and stuff. And so we talked to her and she jumped in as well. And the big thing with Buck 69 itself as the musicians, everybody in the entire band is like their own individual and has a lot of things going on themselves. Buzz had his own band and he kept doing that. Candace was doing uh, a lot of stuff. She actually, right now, her and a uh, uh, guy, Chris, that plays piano, they play around Toledo and do the piano bar type stuff and everything. And um, BJ Love, he's been in several uh, other blues bands, the uh, Good to Bad to Blues, uh, which is played down in Memphis and stuff as well. Uh, and he's, plus he's a stage actor. Um, everybody's really talented, all, all of them. And so I've always, let everybody just go and do what they're doing. And we fit that around the schedule of what we were doing. So it worked out nice. It was good. I was uh, pleasantly surprised to hear Candace singing lead on a couple, two or three songs on No Medicine Like the Blues. It was like, wow, there's her voice up front. Well, we, right. We did that. We did the first CD and, and, and I had already had most of those songs already written. And so when it came time to do the second CD, I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, I got to I got to write something that I can have her sing. And so the two songs she does on that, uh, I wrote both of those and she was great. She did a great job on them. So Killa. Uh, she's great. Oh, yeah. She's got great vocals, great vocals, great personality, uh, just an all around good person. Just awesome.
And you have great vocals too. The the stuff all over those CDs. You sound great on them. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um. So okay, the first CD came out two thousand and eight, I think. Was it two two thousand seven? Seven. Yeah. Two, yeah. Seven. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. That was the first thing I heard when I started digging into your uh, catalog of two CDs. That that was the first one I heard. And it just blew me away. I was like, "Wow!" Where you can you can see it's definitely a little more rock oriented that one compared to the second one. Yeah, yeah. But you can hear you can hear both blues and rock in both of them, right? Like you were Absolutely. saying. Yeah, I'm definitely. I got that '70s thing in my head, and that's <laughs> that's kind of how I write. So. So yeah, the first uh, the first record. Um, I'm telling you, it was like, I'm listening to Cold Wind and Sometimes and Misery. And it's like, those are the three songs I played to start on the show a few weeks ago. I started with Cold Wind and played right into Sometimes. And then this past week, I played Misery. Oh, nice. Nice. And I just got, you had sent me the, the latest one. I can't wait for the listening audience to hear No Medicine Like the Blues. That's that's a great song. Thank you. Thank you. And then the new song, well, the newest song that you have out, Peacemaker, is another great song. Yeah, that one that one meant a lot to me. I mean, it was definitely more emotional. And even the guys in the band felt it was more pertinent. Tell, tell me about that, how that how that came about that song came about i can i can figure out how it came out but i want you to tell me how that song came about last year um one of the school shootings mass shootings and I, I think it was it might have been the texas one there's been so many now that i can't remember but um i i'm watching it on the news and uh and everything on Facebook and it's always, it's always lots of thoughts and prayers, you know? And so I, I'm like, that, that's not a solution. It, I, I mean, it's nice and it makes everybody feel a little better, but it's not the solution. And, and then at the same time, Ukraine happened and, and it's just, nothing's getting better as far as that. And so I sat down and I come up with that idea and uh that's where i got i started writing and put it together and then i had to actually i made sure that i asked each individual musician before we went into the studio i let them hear it to make sure they were okay with doing the song because of how country you know, controversial. Controversial it is a little bit. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. So so I made sure it was okay with each one of them. And uh and we talked about it. And um you can see in the video we definitely leaned more towards Ukraine <clears throat> and what was going on there, the conflict there, yeah. than anything here in the United States. Well, if the listening audience is listening. You need to go and find the acoustic version that's on YouTube that Tom put out. I think that was prior to it, right? Before it come out? Right. 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 And you, should... can, you can see the emotion in, in your playing and singing on that acoustic version is great. Thank you. Yeah. And Thank then, you. then listening to the actual band version is even better after that, once you see both. Yeah, I always I always find it interesting because uh, I'll play something for people acoustic of, of how I originally wrote it. And then when they hear it, once the band's together and what I was actually hearing in my head that I wanted to happen, uh, a lot of people were like, holy cow, <laughs> look at the difference. Tell me where the name Buck 69 comes from. I, um, when Alex, back when Alex said that he wanted to start a band, of course, I'm like, okay, so we got to come up with a name. And uh, 
I'm cruising down Route 75 here in Ohio, headed southbound. And um, believe it or not, there's a road called Buck Road. And uh, I'm doing like 69 miles an hour down 75, and there's Buck Road, and I said, Buck 69. And I said, sure, why not? And that's where it wow. came from. Nothing, wow. nothing special about it other than just happenstance, you know? That's great. So let's talk about the first record. When you started to do that, you had a whole bunch of acoustic things that you brought to the band. And the band, play, you know, you, you had them arrange them the way you wanted it. How long did that take to do that? <laughs> the first one was... Uh... Uh, like two and a half years. Um, great story. I got the guys together, said, okay, let's do the CD. And I told them what we were going to do. And they were all forward for it. And they I said, okay. And so I found a studio here in town. And uh, I, I'm not going to say the name or anything, but uh, a good studio. And I gave the guy 900 bucks down. And he had a student that was working in the recording room and said, this guy's going to handle what you do. And if he has any problems, he'll uh, get with me and stuff. And so I got uh, three songs, the tracks down, rhythm for drums and bass. I had given them $900 down and I called to set up uh, another time to go into studio. And uh, he says, Tom, I got bad news. He says, um, the kid I had as a student uh, got upset. I can't remember why or whatever, but he took the hard drive from the computer with all the songs that they'd been doing, including mine, so already that were in there, and left and went home to Cincinnati. Wow. So all my stuff was gone. And that's how I started off <laughs> my first experience with recording. <laughs> so he says, I can get you somebody new. I says, I said, no, I can't do that. I says, because I pay these guys when they come in there, I'm paying the musicians myself um, for studio time and stuff, not just you. I'm paying those guys as well. They're not doing this for free. Um, I said, and I've already paid them for this time they already did. And uh, I, I said, just give me my $900 back and I'll, I'll figure something else out. And by chance, I found John Sevilla. Um, he had a studio also in town here. And um, he, uh, I got a hold of him and I, right away we clicked. It was a totally different situation. He's a really great musician, could play lead guitar. And actually he's the lead guitar player on No Medicine. Um, just phenomenal musician and stuff. And we like the same kind of music. Um, and everything. And he says, yeah, I want to, I want to produce your CD and stuff. And so, uh, I started going over there and, and all the other guys clicked with him as well. And it, it was a great friendship that formed from there. It was, it was phenomenal. Um, but yeah, it, it took like two and a half years because I spent all my own money, um, actually on both CDs. And it, it probably took, um, I would say to two CDs, cost me combined I like twenty thousand dollars to put them all together the marketing the advertising to get them back um but i've got my money back three times since we put it out so I, I mean it was worth it the whole thing to do to do what we did so we were talking before the interview about now you can uh, you're, you're getting input from all over the world premier music Tell me a little bit about when that started and, and how that's affected what you do now today. The, um, I guess I hit it at a, that, two, that 2004, two, 2007, you know, internet was taken off, cell phones were taken off and it, I, I've got a degree in business management, marketing, that type of thing. And, um, so I was able to know how to get the marketing out, re reach the right people to get reviews and, and things like that. And the internet, it lets you just hit an entire world of population of people. Blues, as you know, that genre is not like at the top of the list 
of what's listened to uh, worldwide. I, I mean, you, you're competing with country and pop and, and now rap and hip hop, that it's, type it's of thing. A niche, it's a niche music. Absolutely. Right. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, and my market, I knew that the market range was uh, the 55 and older crowd. And uh, so the internet let me target those people, target those people, those age groups. And little by little with the uh, help with people like you, yourself, uh, and, and interviews and uh, that type of thing, the marketing, it, it really helped huge i mean and it, it helped me meet a lot of friends i mean as far as different musicians and stuff i we've never met but we're friends from all over the world yeah yeah me too with right radio, my radio show and and people all over the world it's it opened a whole new world up because i mean radio my radio station goes with two million people about 20 30 miles it's fm but now it's worldwide. So I, anybody in the world can listen to what I'm doing. Right. Right. So yeah, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. On the other hand, the only thing that's kind of sad about that is that, and you know, as well as I do that we're so over flooded with information yeah. uh, constantly all the time between TikTok and spot just tons and tons of information that now it's like if you don't catch somebody's attention in the first 30 seconds they're gone yeah. especially the younger crowd and it's sad because as far as I'm concerned the best music ever was 60s and 70s and uh, early 80s and to get kids and stuff to listen to that it, it's like pulling teeth Yep. So the next record came out quite a few years after the first one. No medicine like the blues. Tell uh, me, yeah. tell me so about this time, that. This time I had to, uh, the songs I had for uh, When She Whispers Your Name, uh, I had already had them kind of, you know, you know, pretty much ready to go. So I had to write all new stuff um and, and john so just to give you an understanding to also is when i decided to do the cds i told my son i said when we do a cd i i want a person to be able to put the cd in the car and be driving down the road and not think they're hearing the same song every time i i want diversity in the songs so you can put it in and you want it to just let it play and hear the different things and, and get you know air ear candy and just keep on going and not get bored halfway through the cd and and so i concentrated on trying to do that and that's the reason why i had alex as far as with you, the rocket you, you were successful because when and, i put when i put the first cd in it was like wow these all these songs are different just like you said. Right. And that's and that's what I want. I didn't want things to be all the same. And, and so when I wrote the, a bunch of the new songs for the next one, it took me a little while. And the first one also, you know, your first CD, you get kind of excited and you want to get it done. You just want to and you, and you rush a little more. So on the second one, we took our time a, yeah. a lot more. Time and the production that. on the second one. It sounds great in a car, I'll tell you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. The production, the um, arrangements in on a, a lot of those, including No Medicine Like the Blues, what a great, great song. You you change up a little bit halfway through. Yeah, it, we do the little speed up, sure. Yep, and uh, it, it it sounds great when you do it. And you, you can't even tell you're doing it. Yeah, we did. The, I told him I wanted a gradual. That's what we have a little bit of a breath where it's just the keyboards and the bass and the drums to, to lead into that speed up. Uh, John Sevilla played the lead guitar on that. And BJ Love, I, I mean, he played the keyboards, the piano. And we, we sat down and, and when I gave it to BJ, I said, I want you to do the piano to match the syllables 
in the sentence of my lyrics as I'm singing it. And so he's, I gave him the guitar chords and stuff like that. And he sat down and he matched the keyboard to go along with the, uh, the sentences and the lines as far as the lyrics. And then when John, once we did that, I told John, I said, now you already got the keyboard part. I says, you should be able to mirror that. And then I'll let you let loose when we get to the, this change up and speed up and stuff. And you can let loose on it. And he played that uh, uh, lead on a flying B uh, Marshall stack and with by, with his fingers, no picks. Wow. So let's talk about a short period of time. You were out playing with the band and you had to stop because of COVID. Tell me about that. Right. Well, a little before COVID, um, we had already started kind of like everybody, the younger people in the band were all wanting to do their own, really pursue their own thing. Even my son, uh, uh, my son had uh, started his own uh, speed metal band uh, called Bathhouse Betty. And they were real popular around Toledo here. And I mean, really tight, really good. Um, and, and he, you know, he had people his age, that type of thing. And it, it was more, he started to go that way and buzz, Buzz was getting calls to go and play with other blues musicians, maybe like out on tour for a little bit and stuff. And he had his own band going. So he had that going. And Candace, again, she started, uh, like I said, she started the uh, piano thing. And so everybody was kind of like doing their own thing and it started getting busier with that. So I kind of like got to the point where I was like, you know, they're young. It's their turn. Let them go yeah, do let, what they're let doing. Them, let them do what and, they have and, to do. Right. And don't bug them and stuff like that. And 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 I said, okay, I'm just going to kind of like sit back. I'm going to play some acoustic. And so I hooked up uh, with a friend of mine, TJ Karras, and we were going around playing around Toledo and, you know, two, three times a month. And we were playing acoustics like three hour nights and stuff. And uh, I'd throw in some of my stuff and we'd do covers and um COVID hit. And then at that point in time, I was, I just said, you know what? I, I'm not going out and playing out anymore. I said, I'm going to concentrate on writing. Um, and when I got something I feel that's worthy to take into the studio, I'll just get a hold of the guys and say, Hey, uh, free up some time. And, uh, are you interested in recording this with me? And, uh, that's what we've been doing. And they all said, yes, sure. Sure. I That's mean, great. they love going in and, and getting a chance to record and throwing it out because they, they know how popular as far as a Toledo band. I mean, Buck 69 has got pretty popular as far as around the world. So, but Buzz was playing someplace and uh, somebody from New Jersey was here in town and they said, aren't you in that band, Buck 69? And he was like, sure. <laughs> So, you know, see, you never right. know. Right. So that record came out. You've been still doing acoustic stuff. The next record, that's my next question. You, you're working on, on putting together some songs for a, yeah. for a third record. Yeah, I've got, I have enough right now uh, for a third one. And, uh, I could actually take like four, I have four that are actually recorded, but uh, including this one that's coming out in the next few weeks. But um, it seems to me it, it's easier nowadays to just release a single. And then I think once I have enough that's actually, you know, say 13 or 14 songs, 16 or whatever, then put them all together and then release it uh, and, and just do like one at a time right now. It, it's, I'd rather take my time and get them the way you want where, them, where I want them and, wh and what I like and know it's, it's something that's worth putting on a CD and stuff. And um, yeah, it's, and then plus at the same time with the way the internet and stuff is nowadays that I, you know, you got people like you can collaborate with and stuff like that. Uh, the song, trust me with your, with your money. Um, I, I sent it over to you. I don't know if you had a chance. To I have it. it. It's great. And, and it's just something to be fun, 
to be have fun with and stuff like that. But um, do you know Lori and Rusty Wright? Rusty Wright band. I know who Rusty Wright is. Yep. Uh, okay, so uh, I've known them a long, long time, and uh, so I got a hold of them, and I says I asked Rusty if he wanted to do, and he played the lead on that, and huh. so you know I sent him the what we had as far as the music and stuff and told him what I was looking for. And then him and Lori did some backup vocals and Candace did some backup vocals and I did stuff here in Toledo. And and now it's, you're able to work with people from all over the world. This like the strings that are on Peacemaker uh, is from a guy that's from Spain that did the strings for me. He works with Sony and stuff like that. And uh, I, gave him a copy of the song and said, I'm looking for strings. I want a cello, maybe first, second chair, violin. And he said, Tom, I can take care of you. No problem whatsoever. And, and like two weeks later, I had the strings for the song. Wow. Yeah. It, it's just amazing. I, and I'm sure like um, different people that you're interviewing and talk to and stuff, they'll tell you the same thing. I mean, you can do a lot of stuff nowadays um and collaborate or work with people long distance and it's just amazing the people you get to meet well the the singles thing is a big thing now all these all these great artists that are out there i'm putting full records out they're doing one single then two singles and then all of a sudden the record comes out right and that's kind of like the way i'm leaning the same thing i i just think nowadays it's the way to go and then plus by releasing a single you can see how well it does Yep. And how, how, you know, how it took, it took off as far as different people and what kind of vibes you got back from people on your Facebook page or, or YouTube and that kind of thing. And you can say, yeah, that's worthy of putting on a CD. And then you put your CD together. So, and I can see why they would do that. Um, and it just keeps your name alive. And, yeah, it, and keeps it keeps it open for them to, you know. This is a great song. When's the next one coming? Basically? Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So Peacemaker, we've been talking about that song. You were talking about st adding strings to it. And how is that done overseas? Have people... Uh... It's very popular in, believe it or not, Russia and Ukraine. <laughs> wow. How do you know that? <laughs> by the way, because uh, my analytics that I get from YouTube and from Spotify, um, they give me uh, a report uh, every month as to the uh, people that are listening. Is it males, females, age groups, um, what country is listening to them? And we're getting listened to just about every country there is in the world right now which is just shocks the heck out of me. So well, let, let me ask you a, a question that begs back to one we just spoke about. How are you doing with the 55 plus across the that's, world? That's the major, the people, the majority actually that listen to us are males. A larger population is male and it's 55 up to 65 in that age group. Wow. A lot of them. Yeah, which it would make sense because they're people that listen to the music from the 70s and appreciate yeah. the rock and the blues, that type of stuff. That we Stones. grew up on. You and I right, grew up that on. we grew up on. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So listening audience doesn't know this, but I'm going to have you. You said you do one acoustic and it's a new song. You're going to debut it it's world premiere for us <laughs> world premiere <laughs> um yeah it's called low rent motel and it's due out in three four weeks i i really appreciate you taking the time to do this but I, I appreciate you doing this for all these years and, and keeping them and keeping the music alive that's for darn sure All right, it's called Low Rent Motel, and uh, back last year, uh, I, where I work at, uh, just down the street, is this hotel that's, uh, uh, it's, yeah, not the greatest hotel in the world. <laughs> really, really low, uh, low, low, low morale kind of stuff, and, uh, but it, it's, that's what gave me the idea for the song. 
And uh, so when you're listening to it, I, I hope it makes you want to go take a shower afterwards <laughs> because that, that's how bad the motel is. So, <laughs> but uh, low rent motel. Have you heard about a place where secrets are made on the outskirts of town? A place to escape the life you hate for just forty dollars down. They charge by the hour, don't check your ID, never discriminate. The signs lit up 24-7 for the special overnight rate. Cross your heart and swear not to tell. It's one little stop on the road to hell. Down at the low Grand Motel. Down at the low Grand Motel. It's gonna cost you double to blow away your troubles in room number nine. Called the horse stable, just a chair and a table anymore would be a waste of time. A blue big lighter, little powder and a spoon, clean needles cost a dollar more. Ready, set, go, strap yourself down for a ride on the black tar horse. Cross your heart and swear not to tell, just one little stop. On the road to hell, down at the low Grand Motel. Down at the low Grand Motel. If you want to pretend there's a room on the end for all your twisted dreams, she'll do all the things you better have won't. There's nothing too extreme. No name's the game, money up front to make all your wishes come true. Check the menu for amounts, there's no discount for the minutes you don't use. Cross your heart and swear not to tell, just one little stop on the road to hell, down at the Red Motel. Down at the low red motel the neighbor's wife or the secretary secret rendezvous at night cheap discreet tangled up in sheets to hell with what's wrong or right he says I won't tell if you don't as well just a little fun between us friends Till one says love and the other one runs. You know that's how the story ends. Cross your heart and swear not to tell. Just one little stop on the road to hell. Down at the Moon Motel. Down at the low. Have you heard about a place where secrets are made on the outskirts of town? A place to escape the life you hate for just forty dollars down. Cross your heart and swear not to tell. It's one little stop on the road to hell. Down at the Blue Grand Motel. Down. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. And you're going to do that with the band? You're going to get it set up with the band, this song? It's all, uh, it's just, it's like 98% recorded. And um, all I have to do is put Candace's uh, backup vocals on it next Wednesday. 
and then we'll master it. And like I said, probably two, three weeks, it should be out. And you won't even, uh, it, totally different from what the acoustic sounds like. I mean, it's the same format, same, but once you add the lead guitar, drums, bass, and that kind of stuff, it's Buzz Anderson does a phenomenal job on the, on the uh, lead guitar part. You're going to have video with it like you do with the others? We Yeah, we will. But it'd probably take about a month, month and a half for the video to come out. Great. I usually release it on uh, CD Baby and get it sent out to all the Spotify, iTunes, and that kind of stuff. And uh, at the same time, I'll get a hold of my guy at uh, uh, in Europe that does the videos. Um, and then he'll put it on his YouTube page. He's got like 200,000 followers and he, it's, he runs a thing for slow blues and blues music and he's got a huge following. So going forward, send me the track. Oh, you play. I will make, I will make sure you get a copy right away before, as soon as it's mastered and ready to go, I'll, I'll get you a copy right away. I got another question for you. I went, I went, yeah, I went digging through youtube video and there's a lot of acoustic songs that aren't on those two records that are like fabulous like i won't let this world bring me down is that going to be something you're going to do one of those uh, i'm looking at either doing recording that one next or i actually just wrote one that uh, i'm just working out some details uh called poor boy blues and uh i'm trying to decide do i want it, to it's fast yeah. Uh, so more of a blues rock type thing. And I'm trying to decide, do I want to do that or, uh, don't let the spring wor world bring me down. So, and there's others, old soup can pot pothole prison blues songs. I'd never heard before. Yeah. Pothole prison blues. Uh, actually it is out there now, uh, under my name. It, it's not under the buck 69 name. That's um, the other question I had for you. With all the uh, acoustic stuff that you've done in the past, are you ever going to do something solo, put a solo record out with all these great songs? I don't know. I, I mean, I, the Pothole Prison Blues one is out there now as a single. Um, so that is a possibility because a lot of uh, the singer-songwriter stuff I have doesn't fit the Buck 69 genre. It's more Americana, uh, it's a roots, uh, you know, singer songwriter stuff. And I've thought about doing it. I just need to make sure I have enough songs. And I've also had a few people that have contacted me that are young and coming upper comers that are actually wanting to record some of the songs. We can't be silent anymore is another favorite of mine that you do. That, that was written for my son that passed away. Right. Yep. Great, yeah. great song. Thank you. So how do people find out about Buck 69? Uh, just Google us. We're everywhere. <laughs> as soon as you write, type in Buck 69, we're everywhere. Spotify, YouTube, tons of Amazon music, everywhere. Buck69.net, not com, right? Uh, not com. It's Buck69.net. Or just type in Buck six B U C K and the number 69. And you'll find us. I mean, we're like 10 pages deep on different things that you can find. One of these days, I hope I can get you to come travel and play on my radio show. Because oh, we, be nice. we have engineers that will record you that are sound recording techs. Nice, nice. So I bring every so often, it, you can't tell from my, there's no web, I don't have a website because it's radio, but... We do, we've done live recording since 1994 in the nice. studio, live on the radio. And I've had all kinds of people, national acts come in, international acts play live on the show. And I'd love to have you come acoustic since, you I know, the band doesn't travel, but it'd be great to have you. If you're ever in the New England area, Massachusetts, let me know. We'll, we'll get you set up. You can come in and play. John, I appreciate that. Now, I, I'll definitely think about taking it up. Uh, if I get some vacation time, I'll get a hold of you, and heck, maybe we can make it happen. Yeah, it's 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 worth it because I, if, if nothing else, I just like to meet you. 
Yeah, I'd like to meet you too. Well, I'm meeting you this way, there but yeah. Well, sure. You know what I mean. Yeah. Sure. Sure. But yeah, the engineers that, that work for me or have worked for me go to school at the university, University of Mass at Lowell. And they go and they, when they graduate, I actually give them an opportunity. It's me giving back to them an opportunity to um, record these, all these live blues bands that come through. They nice. take, they take the recordings and they get a job at a big studio. A lot of, uh, a lot of my engineers in the last few years are, are, are doing recording a major acts all over the country at, at all the big nice. studios. That's great. Um, one guy, one guy that I had a few years ago was an uh, assistant engineer on a Steely Dan record. Um, and now that's that are that's some great musicians right there. Right. So my engineers, when they leave, they take the blues recordings that help them get a job, and then once they get the job, there, that's it. They're nice. in, they're working in the big studios. Um. So yeah, I'd love to get you to come in if we can pull that off and, and get you to play live and we'll get some of the songs down too live for you. Sure. That sounds like a, sounds like a plan to me. I'll definitely think about it. Maybe talk to Alex and the two of us come out and yeah. we can, he can back me up on acoustic. So let's talk one more thing. I wanted to ask you about the, this next record. When do you say, I know you say you have most of the songs. How long do you think it'll take before we'll see another record? Um, Next I'd year, say, maybe? I'd say one to two years. I'd okay. say one to two years. Yeah. That's I'd, good. That's good. I, I I would, mean, to, to be honest, I would say that the holdup is more uh, money than it is just getting them done. You know, since I finance the stuff myself and everything, uh, it, it's just doing it gradual. And as I'm making the money, I put it aside to go in and do this uh, a song. So, well, if you come, we have a multi-track recording studio, so we can multi-track your recording if you want. Oh, nice. And um, you keep talking like that, the whole band might want to come. <laughs> well, bring the whole. I'd love to have the whole band, but I know, I know that logistically, that's not possible. Right. That's that's pretty tough, but. But yeah, you, you and your son as a duo, that would work too. Yeah, it, there's a couple videos out there of me and him when we played acoustic stuff together uh, uh, when we went down to Memphis for the Blues Challenge and stuff. So uh, we clicked pretty good. You could tell, I mean. There is one other question I had when I was looking through your, your bio. I didn't realize that you could submit CDs to the IBCs. Did you do that? Yes. That was way, I mean, when we first did the, um, did the both CDs, they were still accepting uh, CDs to the IBC. Sure. Do For, you know Vinny out of Florida? Do I know who? Vinny out of Florida that usually goes to the IBCs and. On the couch. No, and, I don't. Uh, music on the couch. Uh, he's I know about goes, that. Yeah, I know about uh, Yeah, he goes down there every year and stuff. He interviewed us and everything. He's. Another one like you that's real heavy, though, into the IBC stuff and the blues and everything. Great guy. Same thing. Um, but, yes, they did at the time. Uh, not much as Toledo here. They don't have um, – actually, I think last year was the last year for the Blues Society here in Toledo. It was either last year or this year. Fortunately, it was here when I first started, and I met so many beautiful people from being involved in that and everything. It was just blues people. You know, you sing sad songs or uh, um, blues songs, but they're some of the greatest people in this world. Yep, you're right. Yep. And it's not all sad music either. People don't realize. Right, right. It's not. Absolutely, it's not. Nope. Well, Tom, I just want to say thank you for spending some time with me this afternoon. And I look forward to maybe down the road, get you to come in and play live on my show one of these days. Yeah, I definitely appreciate the offer. And I will get you 
uh, first copy of this new song coming out. Yeah, anything going forward that you have new, I want to hear it. There you go. I will do and that. I will play it, I'll tell you. And when we do this, when I rebroadcast this interview on Saturday, 4 o'clock, the listening audience is going to hear some of your first album, early stuff, and then we're going to play the interview, and then right after the interview, they're going to hear Peacemaker and your latest record. All the way through, the whole thing. I'm playing the whole thing. Nice. Nice. That's great. That's great. And you can listen. If you're around and not working, you can you can listen. www.wuml.org. Yeah, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to pass it around to everybody I know. I'll put it on my uh, LinkedIn and Spotify, wherever I can put it out there, Facebook and stuff. I'm going to definitely pass the word. So. By the way, thank you for watching the video with uh, Roger Earl last week. Right. Oh, yeah, it was it was awesome. That, that was the first one I seen. And I seen a couple other ones. I'm definitely going to start scrolling through and going and checking out the other ones. Yeah, there's a lot of great interviews I've done over the. Yeah, that's what I, I want to see that, because I, I know you've got to talk to some just phenomenal people. Well, so. Kim Simmons, you want to watch that one, too. Yep. From got Savoy it. Brown. That was that was fat. That was a fascinating interview. I'm sure. I'm sure. And then, you know, there's others, there's, you know, uh, all kinds, I get to talk to a lot of different people. It's, 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 it's tough sometimes to, to connect with them because of their schedules, a lot of right. them. Right. right. But if I can do it, I'm trying to do it like this during the week where they're not as busy and that, you know, there's not as many gigs. The weekends are hard to do it. I could do it on my show, but it's not easy for them. So no, I could see that. Definitely. Yep. And and now I'm able to do it. I mean, I I have an in with Alligator, my the record company. Whenever someone, whenever one of their artists comes to town, I can get an interview with whoever it is. Now, great, great. And that's you know with other labels as well. I'm working on on doing some of that as well. And so then guys like you that I find that again. The reason I've been doing this all these years is to find people like you that are doing that are that are killing it out there. And thank you, thank you. Do you? I mean, do you uh, know Sonny Mormon or Maria Danes or? Uh, I don't. Yeah, there's there's that's the thing about the internet that's so great, and what you're doing, I'm sure you can see. Right? You just get to really find so many and so much talent out there that's just blows you away. It's amazing. Well, just in Europe right now, the, the, uh, I, we, who was I talking to about that? It might've been me. There was somebody. <laughs> it might've been. Yeah. But yeah, Europe is, is, is absolutely wild, crazy with the amount of great blues artists that are coming right. out of England, coming out of Italy, coming out of, you name it, all over the, all over Europe. Yeah. There's, there's tons of artists. Right? I follow a girl, uh, Maria Danes. I, I just love her stuff. She's a great songwriter, just awesome vocals, a lot of blues stuff. And uh, Marcus Gills, I follow him. I mean, yeah. he's he's travels all over Europe. He's a busker. But him and his son, and and how I met him was his son played bass, and him did a couple CDs together. Same time me and my son did, and so uh, we. We've been through friends through the years and everything, but you it's unbelievable the people that's out there, yeah, especially in England. It's like right. it never stopped. Well, I mean, look at look at you. I mean, look at the Stones and the Beatles and stuff. I mean, that's what they those as kids. That's what they grew up on was blues, blues from the United States. <laughs> that's what's a, that's yeah. what's so amazing is they listen to blues here from the United States and then they become rock and roll guys. Well, so, the other interview I know where who was I was telling was Joe Ueli, the drummer for John Mayall's band. Check um, that interview out. I will absolutely. I he love. Had, it. He had a lot to talk about when it came to John Mayall. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to definitely look at that. I, as soon as I seen how many you had, I says, "Yep." In next next few weeks, I'm just going to start going through and see who all you got to talk to because I was amazed at the one with uh, the guy from Foghat. I was just like, "Wow." Yeah, and, and seeing all these guys because these are all people that I grew up listening, just yeah. like you. 
listening yeah. to and then and then hearing them talking and just nonchalant and relaxing and that's well the way. i have a i have a publicist that i deal with in las vegas his name is john lappin and he's brought me incredible people like i i did a tom rush interview he got me tom rush which is a he's an old folk guy from early on local he lives here in in new england nice um deborah bonham john bonham this drummer of led zeppelin her his sister who's a blues singer over yeah. in england i got I, I got an interview with her um he's been he he gave he got me um the guitarist in john mayall buddy whittington and jim sula that's another interview i did a few weeks ago with them and then that connected me with joe ueli the drummer from mayall and that was even better <laughs> so yeah and this this guy lapin gets everybody he's he's pretty you know he's He's a promoter. I guess he's a publicist. He publicizes for them. And then he comes to me and says, do you want to do an interview? And he throws me all these people and, and like, I'm going to say no. I say, oh, <laughs> right? yeah, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> Send me whoever you want. <laughs> well, definitely tell your friend from Cleveland that I said thank you. I will. Yeah, His name definitely. is Chris Mason. He's thank a big, you. big fan of yours, too, as well. Nice. All right. Tom, thank you for all the time, and I uh, look forward to talking to you and the new record, the new stuff coming out. You got it, for sure. It's been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. And again, maybe we'll get to meet someday. And We and will. There you go. I, we'll see. So it's buck69.net. Don't forget that. Go check that <laughs> website out. Thanks so much, John. All right. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right,